start recording. Okay, you guys can see the screen, okay? Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, and one other comment before diving in is that, because a couple people have asked us about problem one on the problem set, that in the supplemental document that I sent, um, this variable to 5x is actually, it's the photon flux. Flux, this is gonna be photons per second, but some people are getting confused that this is not the quantum yield. Um, of the die. So just clarifying that, um, I was explaining in office hours to some people today, you guys are, since this is the first class, you guys are the guinea pigs. So there are typos you guys are finding or things that weren't defined. So hopefully this helps clarify a little bit more on problem one. Um, but getting into today's topic, we're gonna start exploring the field of structural biology and looking at things in structural biology, that means we're getting high resolution structure. So we're getting things down to like the angstrom level or atomic level resolutions. But the drawback of this is that it's like a static method. So we've been talking about optical techniques for the past several weeks. And now we're moving to, okay, x-rays are still a form of electromagnetic radiation, but we're gonna start talking about using electrons and other types of uh, matter to look at biophysics. So if we wanna get really high resolutions, we can't look at things dynamically like we do in light microscopy, but we get all the structural information. And the reason structural biology as a whole field is that structure equals function in biophysics. So if you can tell what uh, the configuration of a biomolecule is, you can then inform or try to understand how it actually functions uh, within a dynamic environment. Um, yeah, so for the goals in this lecture, getting into structural biology is um, understanding, we're gonna get into non-optical methods. understanding why electrons are powerful to use as in a microscopy and also getting into other regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we're gonna be talking about x-rays. Um, we wanna understand, like I mentioned, like why Why, what are the benefits of static methods? And also getting into like how you prepare samples for static methods. So it's quite different than the optical techniques we've been discussing where you add a solution in a cuvette or you put a solution on a cover slip for a microscope that these have much more stringent uh, requirements. Um, so with our, the instruments we're gonna be talking about today, our source is either gonna be electrons or x-rays. These are gonna be two different techniques. Um, and our sample here is gonna be a static sample of your biomolecules or your cells, and it's gonna be specially prepared. Um, the detector, is; these are gonna be um, designed for high energy detection. If you're working with x-rays, that's much higher energy than the visible region we've been talking about quite a bit, um, or the electrons. There's also techniques that go to electrons to signal itself, or electrons to actually photons for an optical readout. Um, and I have an additional arrow here because 
both for electron microscopy and x-ray crystallography, there's going to be post-processing computationally with the data. So these can be the images, these can be Fourier transforms, um, and because we'll get into like that, some of these techniques produce di diffraction patterns. So how do you go from a diffraction pattern to the natural imaging? So there's a computational step here. Okay. So we're going to first focus on electron microscopy, an example of uh, transmission electron microscope here. But big question, since we're shifting gears away from uh, optical microscopy, is why use electrons? And do you guys have any idea of why we would want to use electrons instead of photons? You want to add that in the chat or unmute yourself? Yeah, so Sean brings up that it has a shorter wavelength. So yeah, so that's the biggest benefit of using electrons is um, you can focus them to a smaller wavelength. So if you remember our uh, Abby's law of the wavelength over two times the numerical aperture is your resolution capabilities. With optical microscopy, this is hundreds of nanometers. With electrons, we can get down to one angstrom or so. So you can improve this by a factor of 10 to the third improvement in how tightly you can focus electrons. Um, and I'm also curious, have any of you guys used electron microscopy before and like what type of samples you use it for? Has anyone in the class used electron microscopy? So if no one's used electron microscopy before, um, I would say when I initially think of electron microscopy, oh, let's see, someone added to the chat. Didn't wait long enough. Okay. So Austin used SEM to get depth of field. So what, can you expand upon what you mean by depth of field? Um, I guess opposed to typically when I do some optical microscopy, I don't get a very good depth of field. Um, well, I guess not necessarily talking about biological samples, but samples that that uh, have some sort of roughness to them. Um, so it's hard to resolve a whole sample, a whole area at once if there's lots of different uh, change in z direction. Yeah, so you're trying to get that axial dimension. What type of sample were you looking at? Um, yeah, typically like fracture samples in uh, metals or polymers, okay. just like. Uh, with a rough, rough, uh, rough edge. Yeah. So, um, that's a, yeah, that's great because that's kind of getting to my point. When I think of electron microscopy, I usually think of applying it more to inorganic samples. Let's see, there's another chat. And then Andy says TEM with EELS data. So what type of sample were you looking at, Andy? Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, no, um, boron doped nanodiamonds. Okay. And then EELS is electron loss spectroscopy, right? Yep. Okay. So you're looking at the energy that's lost in the electrons that are interacting with the sample. So we're yep, looking for the plasmons. Okay. Yeah, with the plasmons. So we hear from Austin that he's looking at like metal films. And he's looking at like boron doped like 
nano diamonds. So these examples of like electron microscopy is a super routine tool in more of like the materials characterization. So we do have electron microscopy on campus for in all of the material science cores, but we also you have an entire core for electron microscopy for biological samples. So I would say this was this technique was developed more for inorganic samples, material science, and that's where it's gotten a lot of the development, um, but it is also used in, obviously in this class we're talking about biophysics, but it presents different challenges compared to looking at inorganic samples. Uh, so we'll get into that in the lecture today. Um, so whenever you're talking about electron microscopy, there's two types of electron microscopy, both Austin and uh, Andy use two different uh, forms of that. So uh, we're gonna talk about those. So scanning electron microscopy. or SEM, and then we have transmission electron microscopy, or TEM. And there's variations on these two, but this is like the main grouping of those. And the diagrams here, very simple ones that the star is our uh, sample that we're interested in imaging. Uh, these diagrams show the difference. So scanning electron microscopy, you're focusing to a very fine point. You can think of this like as a confocal version of electron microscopy, where you have a single point and you scan it over your sample. And the electrons are then reflected off of that sample and detected on your detector. While transmission electron microscopy, you can think of it more as like a wide field technique. And also you can think of it similar to like bright field microscopy. You can see that you have electrons passing through your sample, transmitting through your sample, and where electrons do not transmit through, that's where your object is and you're viewing um, um, it going through there. So we're gonna go through some of the details on both of these and um, scanning electron microscopy is gonna be a cheaper form of microscopy because it uses lower energy electrons. They're usually 10 to 100 kilo electron volts. Um, and these don't, because they're lower energy, they're not gonna travel far into the sample. And this creates two types of electrons. It's gonna have backscattered and secondary electrons. So backscattered electrons is what's being showed in this diagram here, so I guess it's very simple. But these are the electrons you're shooting at your sample and then they're scattering off the sample. Secondary electrons are electrons that are gonna be like, those electrons you're shooting at your sample, those are gonna bump off electrons from your sample. So these are electrons arising from the sample itself. And the energies of these electrons are different and they can give you different uh, information. But scanning electron microscopy is more applied for looking at 3D topography. So just what Austin was saying, that's why he was using SEM for and getting at the microstructure of the sample. Or the roughness. With this, this energy of electrons, this is gonna give you about, let's say like four angstrom resolution. Uh, and some requirements for scanning electron microscopy is that your sample has to be conductive. And we'll get into this in more detail in a couple of slides. Um, and also has to be with both of these, it has to be vacuum compatible. Um, and SEM microscopes also have a lot of, if you, it's properly equipped and has additions onto it, um, you can also get elemental information about your sample. 
So this is something called, here, let's see, let me chat. Yeah, so Andy's asking if you can do OJ spectroscopy on an SEM. Um, yeah, so um, OJ spectroscopy is looking at X-ray in the X-ray region of the mission and the energy of these electrons will then excite electrons, um, inner shell electrons. So you can get with energy dispersive spectroscopy, X-ray fluorescence, or OJ spectroscopy. Um, these can all take place on the scanning electron microscope. But you have to have additional detectors. So if you want to do this additional detection of like what elements are there um, at a specific location, you have to make sure that those detectors are there. So energy dispersive spectroscopy or EDS. XPS, OJ, we're not gonna get into the details of those, um, but it's possible. <clears throat> That's scanning electron microscopy, oh, an overview. We're gonna keep going into details with these guys. Um, transmission electron microscopy, we're gonna be working with higher energy electrons. And because they're higher energy, these are more expensive instruments. So you can get 100 to 400 kilo electron volts. Um, and because you're working with transmission through the sample, you're not going to be able to get three-dimensional information here. Um, also with this 3D topography, I want to mention you can like tilt your sample and your stage and scanning electron microscopy to even enhance that 3D information. But you can imagine with this transmission, if you, you're not going to get any surface information. So TEMs used for 2D microstructure, I guess nanostructure. Micro nanostructure. Yeah, this terminology, this can be nano as well. If we're saying that we have four angstrom resolution sub nanostructure, um, like it's also used for interface analysis since it is limited to 2D. Um, you can get very high resolutions with TEM. Uh, you can get down to sub angstrom levels, especially if you're looking at electron diffraction patterns. Um, with crystal samples. So that would be slightly different than like this interface analysis. So there's two different types of modes here. Um, an important thing with being able to have your uh, electrons transmit through your sample is sample preparation can be somewhat limiting here that your samples have to be about 100 nanometers or so thick or else the electrons aren't going to transmit through. Um, and with these two different modes, that I'm mentioning of looking at the nanostructure or the interface, getting an image. You'll be running the TEM with an aperture. Um, to look at the intensity. Of the electron beam. So this is an imaging mode, while with the diffraction mode you would not be using an aperture on the TEM and we'll have a schematic of the instrument set up to show where this aperture is um, that then you're looking at diffraction and you're going to be getting like atomic phase information. So any questions with the breakdown between like SEM and TEM right now? Okay, so let's get in a little bit into the instrumentation layout here. Um, so this is a lot of information at once in the instrumentation, but I wanted 
I like this figure because as a nice comparison that it is a form of microscopy. And you can think of it in the same way that we've been talking about like microscopy and we're just using electrons instead of photons. And you can see that like there's equivalents of the optics that are used in light microscopy. You'll find equivalents um, in electron microscopy as well. But this clearly isn't gonna be like a glass lens to focus um, electrons. This is gonna be uh, a magnetic ring or a metal ring here that you can pass voltages to to then use the electric field to then modify the beam of electrons. Um, and then it'll pass through the sample. Uh, you can see the samples here, down here. Um, but again, thinking in terms of like a light microscope, how we talked about like inverted setups um, where you're looking at like the detector and the excitation are on the same side versus transmissive microscopes, you can see that there's some parallels between electron microscopy and light microscopy. Um, so getting into some of the specific elements of the instrument for the source, your electron source up here, this is typically a heated tungsten uh, filament. And you'll hear it referred to as like an electron gun that'll shoot electrons out of it. Uh, it's important that electrons would have a very low path length and be absorbed by air. So all of this is in a vacuum. Um, since air absorb, absorbs and scatters electrons. So that's one of the limitations and you can think especially in biophysics where all of it is taking place in aqueous solution that this is a big limiting factor here of electron mi microscopy applied to uh, biophysical samples. Um, after creating the electrons from the source, they have to be accelerated towards the sample. And this is done with a potential difference. And based on um, how accelerated those electrons are, that'll be related to the wavelength. And you can do that based on the de Broglie um, relation. And in the leak chapter, they go into the derivation, but we can approximate this um, with Planck's constant divided by the square root of two times the mass of the electron. Um, the charge and the voltage. So you can see this potential difference shows up here. So that will determine what your wavelength of your electron is. So that's what the source, um, how you get your electrons to the sample. So with the sample, we talked a little bit on the previous slide that like TEM requires it to be thin and uh, you have to have those electrons pass through the sample holder. So this image here is a typical TEM grid where you would place like a drop of solution of what your sample is on top of it. And you can see that there's all of these white areas. So then the electrons can pass through it. Um, these typically have numbers and indices so you know where you're imaging on your sample. And uh, I would say I'm viewing this on, I guess like a 15, 14 inch computer monitor. And these are probably, yeah, I'm just drawing it. Um, they're quite small, I think, maybe like two millimeters or so in diameter. Um, so that's how small your samples are for the TEM. Um, for the SEM, we mentioned that it has to be conductive for the electrons to scatter off. So there's pretty stringent requirements with the sample for electron microscopy. And then finally, for the detector, um, just like 
when we talk about confocal versus wide field, for SEM, the equivalent of a confocal setup for electron microscopy, you have a 1D detector. And this is typically like a photomultiplier tube um, where you're detecting those electrons and then multiplying them to enhance uh, your sensitivity. And you can have these detectors, you can have multiple, so you can detect like the primary or the secondary electrons. Um, for TEM, which will be our equivalent of wide fields, you can see that it's in this diagram here, image on a fluorescent screen. It's actually typically, if you um, are using an old TEM, it's gonna be like a glowing phosphorescent screen. Um, for older models, um, but for newer ones, it's going to be a CCD camera since they're cheaper now. Um, so those are some of the basics of uh, source, sample, and detector, the parts of electron microscopes. Um, and you can see here in this diagram, these black arrows are representing like your image, how it's being magnified, uh, and the like. Um, so I want to go into a little bit more detail how I'm saying like it's stringent requirements for the sample uh, for both TEM and SEM. So one big question for biophysics, biophysical samples, is how do you prepare a sample that will work in vacuum? And there's a couple ways. One is doing fixation. Can you use chemistry to make sure that your sample is static and isn't perturbed um, by the vacuum environment? So let's say we're using chemistry here. And you want to covalently cross-link sample. And this is, if you think about biophysical samples, you're gonna be thinking about like amines, carboxylic acids. So you use something, um, it's typically aldehyde chemistry. So a chemist uh, solution of glutaraldehyde will react with those carboxylic acid groups and like fix them to another chemical that you'll have in there. Um, so you first fix it with the, I'm missing a letter here. Maybe not. glutaraldehyde, you first fix it. This is gonna do the co covalent cross-linking and then you're gonna replace, so you're gonna remove the water that's in your sample in like a series of organic solvents. So you can start with your like aqueous sample and then move it like to ethanol, then to like methanol, and then like keep decreasing the polarity of the solvents and then like eventually you'll end with like a dry solvent. So that's one method. Uh, another method is doing flash freezing. I'm sorry, as you could say. Yeah. So right before you, um, uh, what's cross-linking? So cross-linking just means you're gonna be like making a bunch of bonds. So that's like the poor man's explanation of that. I'm sure the polymer scientists might have a more detailed explanation. But here what we're trying to do is just like we don't want our think about when you're putting something in vacuum that like it will change the orientation, it'll make things change its structure. So if you can form strong covalent bonds. So everything's kind of like glued into place. Um, okay, that makes sense, thank you. Um, fixation always reduce or even like diminish cell viability. I know that's why you would probably prioritize flash freezing, but is that 
are there certain fixation buffers that can preserve cell viability? Like viability in terms of like it's still being alive. So all of these, yeah. yeah. So all of these, that's like when I'm talking about static samples and with all of these extreme methods that you're seeing here, you're always looking at something that's dead, that's frozen in time. There's no way that you can, at least that I'm aware of, that you can be doing electron microscopy on a biophysical sample that's still like alive and working. There are like- I'm oh, sorry, I'm actually, I'm confusing flash freezing. Sorry, we do both, okay. but like a slow freeze and mm -hmm. then like stored in liquid nitrogen, you can preserve cell viability, but also like maintain yeah, like maintaining viability for imaging and histology. But I think these techniques diminished or completely got rid of any science. Yeah, so that. yeah, I would say that would be like a different application of like slash freezing or slow freezing. So yeah, you can stick cells in liquid nitrogen, store them for a long time, warm them back up, and they'll still work for proteins as well. Um, but in terms of electron microscopy, there's no way that you can like freeze your sample, go and image it in a vacuum environment, and then like take it out and then let it come to room temperature and like live again and go back and forth. So with these sample preparations, like you're done with your sample. There's no way that they're gonna maintain their viability. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I do want to note there is a form of transmission electron microscopy called environmental TEM. And that works at not super low vacuum and you can still have water in your sample. Um, and there you might be able to look at some living samples. I'd have to go into some details, but since you're focusing more on having like water in your sample uh, and working at higher vacuum pressures, you won't get down to like nanoscale or atomic resolutions there. Um, so that's, that's just worth noting that there is that environmental TEM. Okay. Um, so yeah, getting back into the sample preparation, we have fixation, we have flash freezing. So yeah, you dunk it in liquid nitrogen and hope that like with that flash freezing very quick, that um, your sample won't be perturbed that much. And then finally, the last method I want to mention is that like, if you want to get interior information on your samples, uh, you also have to do slicing. So like Jack just mis mis mentioned histology. So if you want to be looking like within a tissue, uh, you flash freeze that tissue or the like, and then you have to very carefully slice it and section your sample. And this is similar, like, so that's with like SEM, you'll have to do that. Um, and then TEM, if you want to have a thin enough sample, you might have to do that slicing. Um, so these are some of the, ways that biophysical samples are prepared for um, to work in vacuum. But all of this I wanted to point out is that like, it's very tricky, that it's a lot of trial and error. And really there's people who devote like, I would say staff scientists that run electron microscopy course for biophysics, like they're gonna be experts in this. And there's people that like, specializes in this. So if you're working with a new sample, realize that this will take some time. Um, and also all these steps like can easily like, it's tricky because they can perturb the sample. So if you're reading a paper where they're doing electron microscopy and you see these types of techniques like in their procedure, like just think about, okay, that might be perturbing, it might be modifying the sample in some way uh, uh, because these aren't like native conditions for biophysics. Um, so this is for working in vacuum. Another uh, 
consideration for sample preparation is how to create contrast. So if you remember, I mentioned that um, uh, SEM requires a conductive uh, surface. So can you guys think of a way that you might be able to create a conductive surface? For example, there's kind of like a hint on this slide. So Todd and Dushani both mentioned coating the sample or a metal coating. Yep, Catherine says coat it with gold. So this is just a fun image of a spider coated in gold. So a lot of like outreach um, efforts for showing like electron microscopy. They'll do a lot of imaging of bugs because I mean they're large or insects as well. I guess this isn't an insect, it's an arachnid, but uh, uh, it's just cool to see these macro scale organisms coated in gold and stuff. So yeah, if you um, doing a coating of metal, so gold is common, I'd say platinum is common, also titanium nitride is common. And one thing you have to be aware of is if you're trying to get atomic level resolutions with your method, this is adding a layer of atoms. But looking at a spider, you wouldn't care as much. So being aware of that. Um, another thing is more common in TEM is having like staining. And this would be having a certain area of your sample absorb a metal. So there's like negative staining. Which would be like having void area areas of your sample absorb. So you can stick like your sample into like an osmium tetraoxide solution. And like the osmium will scatter electrons uh, significantly or absorb in transmission electron microscopy enough electrons. And then like positive staining would have like the sample absorb. The contrast agent. Um, and this is all, all this coating or the staining is because like water or carbon doesn't absorb or scatter electrons. I mean, it, significantly over a short distance. We want to get specific, like it, electrons would have to pass through about like 150 nanometers before they're scattered in water or carbon. So if you're trying to get, that's clearly not the resolution you're trying to achieve if you're working with electron microscopy. But if you're working with a metal, like for gold, this would be like five nanometers. Um, it's a characteristic length scale and it can be shorter than that as well. Okay. okay. And now getting into a little bit more specific form of electron microscopy is cryo transmission electron microscopy. And this is becoming more and more routine in biophysics. And I'll also say it's like a hot area of biophysics as well. So um, the big advancement in being able to apply electron microscopy to biological samples is the sample preparation. 
So you can see on the previous slide that there's all of those methods of like coding, staining, freezing, cross-linking, it's all trial and error and very difficult to do. Um, but a way to protect your samples from the electron beam uh, was developed with cryo-electron microscopy where you're, flat, you're freezing your samples again, but doing it in a very specific way that maintains the structure of water. Um, so in cryo-electron microscopy, you're protecting biophysical samples. by freezing the sample in ethane that's cooled by like liquid nitrogen. And what this does is it maintains the glassy structure of water. So this is called vitreous water. Um, let's see structure. So with the previous flash freezing I was talking about, if you just dunk your sample in liquid nitrogen, water is gonna reorder itself. So just the same way that like ice cubes expand in your freezer, that's gonna happen in your biophysical sample. And when that water expands and the water orients itself with its polar bonds, you're gonna have distort the structure of your biomolecule. But doing this very specific cooling with ethane, cold ethane, maintaining the glassy structure, this vitreous water structure, is very similar to the native random orientation of water in the sample itself. So this requires specialized sample prep equipment. So you can see here, this is called like a vitrobot from FEI, which is one of the biggest vendors of electron microscopes um, that will take it through that process to maintain this glassy structure. Um, so from this sample prep, what you'll do is you'll do TEM and you'll be able to get very nice images of like lots of different proteins. I think in the first class I showed an example image. So you'll get this wide field image where you have all these nice protein structures just as they were uh, at room temperature in an aqueous solution here now in a vacuum in your vitreous water, frozen water. Um, so you'll get a nice image of all these proteins. And then the next thing you have to do is computation to analyze images. So this is what I've shown in the figure over here. So you can see these are some example images from a TEM. And this is for a bacterial um, membrane pore on the core of some bacterial membranes. And you can see that, okay, they identified 1,661,870 proteins in their images. Then they filtered through it. All of these proteins are gonna have some random orientations and they're going to then try to orient them, overlay them, group them together so then they can get this very high resolution image. They're down to like 3.72 angstrom resolution of the structure of this protein. So with cryo-EM, a key advancement was the sample prep, but another key advancement was the computation and taking ideas from signal processing and image analysis to get to these high resolutions. Um, and since they get down to atomic resolutions, um, this won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2017 and because of that it was a super hot area so like I was looking for jobs that year and the year after and all of a sudden after the Nobel Prize announcement like everywhere was looking for someone who specialized in cryo-electron microscopy and many uh, institutes were also universities were building um, core facilities for people to use cryo-electron microscopy because it is specialized 
it's going to be $10 million or higher than that to have all the equipment, um, the electron microscope itself, the sample preparation, the technical expertise of the people working there and maintaining it to be able to do cryo electron microscopy. Um, and also you can see here, I'll show this on the other slide, that like getting the structure at these high resolutions, um, once you do all the work, once you're able to isolate these, you get nature papers, you get science papers saying like, we solve the structure of something. Yeah, so great question, Julia is asking if there are any facilities at Case or the clinic that do this. Perfect transition. So we do have a cryo electron microscopy facility on campus. Um, it's very new. Uh, uh, so I went to the core website. You can see the building over here and it's a, I saw that picture and I'm like, I've never seen this building. Jack has driven by it. That's really great. So I put the map on here um, that you can see here's the Malt's Performing Center, Art Center. It's at the edge of campus, kind of by like, um, I guess, near the Natural History Museums down here, the Museum of Art and the like. Um, yeah, I was even surprised. I think it might technically be on Ansel Road, which, uh, yeah, it's at the extreme ends of campus. So I'm thinking like, when you guys are going crazy this winter, when everyone's stuck inside, you need to get away from your roommates, you can go for a walk and see this building at the edge of campus. That could be something to do. Um, so there's people associated with um, the medical school, the physiology and biophysics department, the chemistry department, people at the Cleveland Clinic. It has this general Cleveland Center because it has both, um, it has both Cleveland Clinic and case people. And you can see these are the three uh, cryo TEM microscopes they have. So they have three specific separate microscopes that will have different capabilities, those different add-ons if you want to get like the EELS, the energy loss spectrum. And the reason that they built an entire building for these cryo electron microscopes is because they're concerned about if you're trying to get angstrom resolutions, like they're concerned about vibrations and especially like if you think about in the middle of campus at the med school, you have, all, you have like all the life flight helicopters coming in, a lot of vibrations. Um, so they wanted an isolated building at the edge of campus here. Um, and I did want to point out um, that Professor uh, Chakrapani in the physiology and biophysics department, she's doing a lot of work on ion and membrane proteins with cryo-electron microscopy. So, so this is some of their work um, that was published in Nature in 2018, and this is a membrane receptor for uh, serotonin. So you can see that these are like without serotonin present, and then serotonin, so APO means without, and these are the two forms with serotonin, and this transmembrane protein, they found that there's two distinct states of that serotonin membrane receptor. So this plot here is just taking a line section that they drew through the protein and looking at, yeah, this is the distance along and like the pore radius. And they saw that, okay, this yellow guy has a much larger radius that could let things through compared to the blue guy. And they looked at very fine detail. This is a very clear example of structural biology that people want to get down to individual amino acids and how their structure and how their distance is changing at these very uh, small length scales. But if they see that there's two states that they found this transmembrane protein in, that can then relate to, okay, can we then relate that to different diseases? Let's say like, okay, someone um, with one mental disease versus another might have a greater distribution or a mutation that puts this transmembrane protein into state one or state two. I didn't read the whole paper in that much detail. I might be making some stuff up, but that's like the kind of questions of how structural biologists relate this to function, relate this to physiology, relate this to human health and the like. Okay. Um, so I do wanna cover um, some hints and tricks and some of the practical use of electron microscopy if you guys are using it. And Andy and Austin can also point this out. Um, I have some examples over here that are more from material science, but just to point out a few things that with electron microscopy, you can have the same problems as optical microscopes, the same um, aberrations. 
So you can see that guy over here, that this is electron microscopy where they have a spherical aberration where they're looking at graphene structure. So once they correct for that aberration, you can see that like you can actually see the rings of the graphene show up um, in their image. But if you have a blurry image, that can be like the, yeah, the spherical aberrations, the edge aberrations, if you're not focusing um, um, the electron beam right. Um, I also want to point out that electron microscopy is not a type of tool that you can just go in and use once and be like, oh yeah, it's easy to you. That it does require practice, um, trial and error in like figuring out what like knobs to use and the like. Um, and if you're going to use, just measure one sample, um, a lot of electron mic uh, microscopy um, core, play, cores that have electron micro microscopes will have staff be available to say like, oh, I just need to measure this one sample. Can you take a look at it? But if it's gonna be something that you're routinely going to use, then it makes sense to learn how to use this technique. And I would also say that I've seen research groups where if they are going to routinely use it in the entire group, they'll have one person become the expert in it and that person measures all of uh, their samples for them. So that's just emphasizing like it is a, it is a specialized technique and if you're good at it, that's great, uh, but it's not something you can just run in and use. Um, it's also important to think about like the sample damage when you're doing measurements that electrons are, you're, for SEM, you're kicking electrons off your sample, and you can do um, damage of your sample during the measurement. So that's an example in this image here, where you can see that there's charging. So you can have charging of your sample. So this is electrostatic charging of electrons accumulating on the surface um, due to electrostatics. And then that's gonna make your image appear darker. You can even um, heat or sputter away your sample. Um, if you think about the high energies that you're using in electron microscopy. So it's very important to balance like the resolution, and contrast that you want versus, let's say, the electron power settings, your scan speed, and your scan area. If you're scanning slowly with a high electron power, you're gonna see more damage quickly, but you might be able to get like a very beautiful picture. But if you're trying to get a beautiful picture of a very specific area of your sample and you don't have your settings quite right, you can then damage that and then you won't be able to get that picture. So being strategic about um, your samples. Okay, so we discussed a little bit about like price at the lowest end, you can get like a bench top. There's now bench top SEMs um, down to like 50K if you want bare bones model to like the fanciest, the TEM setup will be like, with all the detectors will be like uh, 30 million or so. Um, I would say FEI is the most common vendor. You'll also see Zeiss. FEI was recently bought out by Thermo Fisher, but they're still keeping that name. Um, and yeah, so those are just some pointers. I don't know if Austin and Andy, if you have any other comments related to that, if you guys have used the electron microscopes. Uh, yeah, just like you said, it does take a bit of training. Um, yeah, I remember the first time I used it, especially because you put the sample in the chamber and you can't necessarily see except for any limited that uh, they might have in the chamber. You, uh, It can be kind of worrying. You just have to be careful not hitting, you know, the aperture or anything uh, mm -hmm. when you move your sample around. So, yeah. And yeah, I had a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this picture at the top where you're showing the, um, the spherical aberration, mm -hmm. to what degree, I mean, when you're correcting for the spherical aberration, 
can you do this by, you know, like adding shim fields like you would in an NMR? Or do you have to do it all in post-processing? I'm not sure. I actually think like, so you can see these measurements were like on different SEMs. I think when you run into these aberrations, it's something that you have to fix like on the instrument itself to overcome. Okay. Yeah, you can try the best you can with trying to do some post-processing. But if you see these aberrations, that's like, okay, I need to go back to the microscope and we have to figure out like how to, how to fix this. I would say it's an instrument problem as opposed to like an analysis problem. I see. But you can tune the field right to correct for the aberration. Generally. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't know how to work correct for that, then that's the problem. So yeah, this is where it's like, okay, call over the staff and try to fix this with your settings. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? And then just to show some, what was that? Okay, no. Just to show some applications of using some SEM to some biophysics. Um, this was uh, some work actually by my husband. I made him put this slide together yesterday since he did a bunch of SEM during his postdoc, uh, where he was measuring the mass of individual viruses. So you can see here that they did SEM imaging of the virus capsid, and then they were using this. Um, nanoelectromechanical sensor. So this bar right here is gonna be vibrating at a certain frequency when something lands on it, that frequency changes and shifts. So you can actually measure the mass of an individual virus. So you can see that they imaged their NEMS device here and he did false coloring where you literally just like use layers in Photoshop or GIMP to show the colors here. It's not actually truly colored. Um, and they took the images, this is just the device alone, they're hoping that they can deposit um, uh, these viruses on top. And you can see that the size, if they zoomed in to their little weighing bar over here, and he false colored that the size of these uh, particles here line up with the size of the capsids. So they knew that they were weighing individual capsids uh, in the SEM. So this was proof they were doing their measurements uh, ex situ um, in another instrument, but they used SEM to confirm like, yes, these are actually individual particles uh, shown here. And then I just wanna go over shifting gears. I'm gonna squeeze this in today is talking about X-ray crystallography, um, which is um, also a way to get atomic structure as well. And you guys remember from our talk, our lecture on the electromagnetic spectrum, what the wavelength is for X-ray samples or X-ray radiation? Okay, so the wavelength here for X-rays is a okay. We did get a comment ones to tens of nanometers. So um, yeah, getting in that range and it can get down to around an angstrom for the wavelength. So you can get down to, I'd say to ones of nanometers. We talked about the whole range up to 10 nanometers, but when you're doing X-ray crystallography, you're working at like the extreme range of this. Um, so you can get down to the atomic structure. But how X-ray crystallography works is you're working with a crystal. So this limits the samples that you can look at. Um, so biomolecules that will crystallize and form a large enough crystal to measure are gonna be things that have stable structure and are ordered. But if you wanna look at something, it won't work for like a disordered um, or flexible molecule, I guess. Yeah, flexible proteins and the like. Um, so this has been very important, obviously, in the history of structural biology and also women in science. So you can see Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystallography pattern of DNA. 
or Dorothy Hodgkin, who used X-ray crystallography for many proteins and won the Nobel Prize in 1964. So it's been very important um, for in biophysics and getting at the structures. So how X-ray crystallography works is you're going to have an X-ray source. And this X-ray source can be, here we have shown an X-ray tube, where what you're doing there is you're going to hit a metal with electrons, and that's going to um, cause X-ray fluorescence from the inner shell electrons. So in the leak chapter, they're going to describe it's going to be for different metals. You're going to get different wavelengths. So I'd say that's a common source that can be like on a benchtop instrument or an instrument that's going to be, maybe not a benchtop, like an instrument that can be in an individual lab. But you can also use a synchrotron that will produce electrons, but that's going to be like at like Argonne National Labs, that's not going to be something that like everyone uh, can have access to. Um, and then traditionally, historically, radioactive sources, um, these aren't used as much recently, um, but that's why like every, like Rosalind Franklin passed away quite young because she was using radioactive sources to produce the x-rays. Um, also missing in this diagram here is you're going to have a wavelength selector. So you know the wavelength of light that you're using of the x-ray. And this is going to be um, like a glass crystal that based on the spacing of the atoms um, will select specific wavelengths. So allowing some to pass while diffracting uh, other ones. Um, this lead screen is then used to focus or collimate the beam. Your sample is going to be uh, a big crystal of biomolecules. This is probably like going to be, you have to have a large crystal, like a millimeter in size or so. So this is going to be like 10 to the 15 molecules that are perfectly ordered. So this is really like the hard part of x-ray crystallography is making that crystal. So I don't know, I think Christina, you're our resident chemist in uh, the class. I can't remember if anyone else is. Have you had to do any crystallography in inorganic chemistry at all yet? Or has anyone else in the class had to do that? Or if you've ever even done like the childhood experiment of growing your own rock candy, like think of having to do that for like biomolecule and screening through like hundreds of conditions to try to see like if your rock candy will form. That's that's what X-ray crystallogra crystallographers specialize in is preparing that crystal, and that's the challenge. Um, and then finally, your detection is typically a photographic plate. Or you can think, so just like when you would go to the dentist and you have actual like photographic film, or more recently, of course, there's like digital detectors um, for x-rays. Um, but what you get out for your detection is going to be the Fourier transform of the structure since it's a diffraction pattern. So then you're gonna to have to go in and do a 2D inverse Fourier transform to then get the structure. So that's where the computation comes into play here. Um, so what this is, this pattern here, um, if you guys have taken condensed matter physics, that's gonna be like the K-space and you can think of things with like solid state physics. These are the K-space indices of and the Miller indices of your biomolecules. So there's a lot of overlap 
with solid state physics or inorganic chemistry in terms of x-ray crystallography. Um, so with that, I do want to note, make a last. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, um, I had a quick question about um, x-ray crystallography. So like, mm -hmm. I vaguely remember from like a class I took that um, uh, the, sam the size of the sample is like dependent on like Bragg's law or something like that, where like you want the sample to be like a certain size so that way, um, I can't re I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, I was wondering if you like knew anything about that. Yeah, so Bragg's law, that's a very important point here that like related to like the wavelength of what's going to be diffracted from your sample um, is going to be determined like, yeah, the size that you needed and like the spacing. So yeah, that's an important point. I think in the leak chapter, it'll get into that. Um, but I didn't have like the equation uh, included in here. But yeah, that's a good good point as well. It's like it's like n lambda is equal to the sine theta, something like that, right? Like n, n lambda yeah. is a proportion of the two D sine theta. Yeah, something around that. Don't take my word for it. I'm going to double check on that. I'll get back to you, Todd. On that, I'll put it on the um, Canvas website. Thank you. Okay. And Austin mentions that he worked with material science students who did texture measurements at APS. So is APS, are you talking about argon or somewhere else? Yeah, the, the focus on okay. synchrotron there. Yeah. I mean, it's very cool when you get to like um, get scheduled time at the synchrotron at argon. Um, you just have to be really efficient with your use of time. People typically bring their samples and they have like a shift schedule and stuff to get as much data as you can from there. Yeah, I was, uh, they, they were, I was an undergrad and they were grad students and uh, they brought I went along with them because we had to work like what, 48 hours straight basically. Yeah, yeah. So all hands on deck to get that data. Um, but then once you have all of it, like hopefully fingers crossed the experiment worked and you can uh, have data to work with for a while. That's nice. Okay. So yeah, let's, to wrap up, I do want to mention, since we mentioned cryo-electron microscopy and x-ray crystallography, that historically and up until like very recently, x-ray crystallography was like the key method, but then the high resolutions that you can get with cryo-electron microscopy and not having to freeze your sample, or not having to crystallize your sample, that opens up many different um, more flexible proteins or biomolecules, but also macromolecular complexes. That cryo-electron microscopy has looked at things like nuclear pore complex or virus capsids that you would never be able to crystallize with, with the x-ray technique. So this plot here is showing the number of um, deposits in the protein data bank that you guys worked with in problem set one. This is like the number of entries that have been added with cryo EM. So you can see like it's taking off and I didn't find the plot for x-ray crystallography. I'm sure there's still contributions there, but there's a lot of new areas to explore with cryo-electron microscopy. Um, and I uploaded a new chapter from the leak book and I don't know how he came up with these huge titles for his chapters or how he's organizing things, but these two sections uh, have to do with electron microscopy and x-ray crystallography if you guys need more um, information. So uh, that's what I had. Are there any other questions?